think with this mellifluously eloquent man beside me, I shouldn't be taking up any time. Um, and John said he's just quite happy to pick up where we were. So again, if folk catch my eyes and we'll take contributions and three. Um, anyone that's engaged with John's work, please do pick us up on it. Um, so. Kendra? Um, I just want to actually follow Neil's comment of, about the dual character of labor. And I'd just be interested to know your thoughts on what a feminist analysis of kind of Marxian conception of labor, so in particular I'm thinking about feminist debates around social reproduction, might um, bring to that, I suppose. So if we're, if we're talking about the commodification of labor, what about all the many people whose labor isn't commodified, or who in fact, in, in a feminist analysis, don't even have the opportunity to commodify their labor. Um, so that would be one question. And just a kind of follow-on point from that is that I, th I, I really like this idea of the, the rage against the rule of money, about money being a, a barrier in all kinds of ways. Um, but also kind of being the glue that holds together the social synthesis that you talk about. But again, I wonder from a feminist perspective, I can imagine a society without money that is still a deeply unequal society. So patriarchy, for example, is not reducible to capitalism. So I just wonder about what other, um, what, how you think about the other kinds of divisions within society that may take a particular character under capitalism but aren't reducible to capitalism. Um, I, I haven't read your stuff, so uh, this is kind of new to me. Um, but it uh, just made me think. Um, one thing that the, the cracks, and it, it, it brought to me to mind for me a picture of a volcano. And there, there's, a, there's a bit spitting off here and a bit spitting there, and the state is trying to push it down, and there's another bit coming up and another bit coming up. And like you say, there, there is no, uh, any one of them could become the explosion. Um, just that, yeah, that, that, that I gave me a picture of that. Another thing, um, what I've been involved with the Free Hetherington here, and having been involved on, let's say, the margins of politics for a long time, because once you get involved in that, you become marginalised as well. Um, but the amount of young people here, that it, there's a very, there's a spontaneous feeling to this place and to the people here, and um, a, a real righteous anger about th this, the whole university and the, 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 the top-down thing that's feeding down, and these people here running the university are doing what they're told and expecting us to do what we're told, and uh, there's a, there's a, there's a really, a really beautiful feeling um, of what's happening with young people. Um, and the, the thing you would say, you would, when you mentioned soldiers, and I got the, you know, the picture of the guys in World War I, and it wasn't the, it was the gun behind you. you know, if you don't go and do what you're told, there's the gun that's going right. to shoot you. And what I see, the hope here is that, um, like, uh, it's the people who have, have an investment in capitalism that are now being affected by it. The, the, the ones that have been sold the, 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 the property dream and the earn more money dream even up the holiday and blah 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 and that's now being gradually taken away and I even noticed that like the cops are getting pissed off now because they're going to cut theirs you know and we, we, I remember the, the uh, eviction here and just saying that to cops and, they, and they, they, you could see on their faces they were going they're right you know but, the, but of course they can't say it because they're superiors of it you know the guns at the back um, I think that's yeah and again, you know, a lot of the, the middle class parents who are now going, we've, we've got money, we've always expected that we, you know, we would help our kids through university, but now it's, it's out, out of our reach. We can't do it. They're demanding more and more. Mm. And it's those people, when they're changing, they're being affected, that I can see the hope that things will really change big. Yeah. And like that. Um, I just wondered if you could say a bit about publishing and your relationship to it as a, a writer of books, um, just in the context of capitalism and kind of generally dissemination of uh, your information. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, let me start with the second one, which is maybe the easy one. <laughs> well, or not the easy one, I don't know. Volcanoes I love. Um, <laughs> I, I live close to a volcano that is constantly smoking and occasionally throwing out ma masses and masses of, of ash and that's a kind of constant source of, 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 of inspiration. Um, and I think it's my <laughs> sort of... <laughs> I don't know to turn it up. <laughs> Sorry, I haven't, le haven't learned how to turn it off yet. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, also righteous anger is, one of, is, is, is a great expression. I mean, that, the, 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 the Zapatistas organized this festival of, of dig Digna Rabia. Um, what, two years ago, and probably the best best translation of that is righteous anger. In other words, and and that by righteous anger, I understand not just um, not just negative anger, but anger that also turns creative you know, in the way that the the cracks do, or in the way that the way that um, that that I understand Free Hetherington to be. I mean, that for me is. Yes, it is righteous, righteous anger. <laughs> can can, yeah, can, can, can I you. give that to you? <laughs> <laughs> I knew they'd come in useful for something. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think that's right. I mean, that there is the the, the um, that that it is fantastic to see. Um, you know, I think one thing that used to happen for a while is that you, you would have meetings like that and you know, suddenly you'd realise that all the people there were the same age as, 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 as well, were getting older and older, no? And that was kind of disheartening and I don't think that's the case at all. No? Well, it's certainly not the case here. But <laughs> it, it's, it's also not in general the, ca the case in the sort of meetings that, 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 that I'm involved in. The, the final point um, about how things are getting more and more difficult, yes, because I think when we think about um, how, how can we imagine the situation changing, how can we imagine a kind of an explosion of anger, um, then I think it's very important to think, well, capital is not stable. Capital, by its nature, is a constant attack. No? It's a constant process of saying faster, faster, faster. That's what the law of value means. The law of value is that, that means that capital, in order to survive, has to produce things um, in, in ever less, ever smaller amounts of time. So it involves a constant attack of faster, faster, faster. And the things that weren't seen as being incompatible with capital before gradually f become attacked. They gradually become um, problematic in terms of a relation for capital. For example, having time, time just to play with our children, for example. You know, it's <coughs> not an obvious revolt against capital, but as capital compresses that time, as capital makes that sort of thing more and more difficult, then just doing that sort of activity or doing activities that have meaning to, for us become converted into a sort of revolt against capital. Um, so uh, the there's a kind of built-in instability to the situation. It's not just when will people all revolt against capital. Capital is a constant attack. It's a constant aggression. You know, and at some point, you know, it's a constant challenge in a way to say, no, no we are attacking you. Revolt, will you? No. In a way, that's what's happening in the universities. No, constant. No, you can, you know, they go further and further in ways as if they're kind of pushing people, pushing people to revolt. And, and the question.
question is, well, when will the worm turn, as it were? I mean, it, it's, it's not a stable thing. It's not a, um, the question of the feminist perspective on labor, I think, is, 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 is clearly very important. Um, two things, I think. First of all, the, the argument in the book, what I try to do is that try to understand, I suppose, capitalism in terms of the organization of our activity. No? In other words, it, it's the basic idea that in, if we want to change the world, then to somehow, somehow we have to understand the world as being our own product. We have to bring it home to ourselves. So we have to have what Marx calls a critique ad hominem, which of course is a sexist term to start off with, but a critique that brings it home to, to, to human activity. Okay. So the, the argument about abstract and concrete labor is an argument that the key to understanding um, all forms of oppression, including patriarchal, patriarchal domination, including the very existence of um, the idea that there are only two sexes, that there are two and only two, two sexes, that is actually generated by the way in which our activity is organized, the antagonistic form of, of our activity. Okay. In other words, that implicitly rejects the notion that we ha have on the one hand capitalism and on the other hand patriarchy. No, I mean, that what I'm trying to say is that, the way that, that patriarchy has to be understood, I suppose, as part of capitalism. But part of capitalism in which we understand capitalism as the way in which human activity is organized and has been organized for the last, last few centuries. Okay. On the other hand, the argument as well is that if we understand the antagonism, as an an the central antagonism of capitalism, as the antagonism between abstract and concrete labor, then it is clear that abstract labor, the abstract laborer, is really a he. Okay. The alienated laborer, the, the movement based on abstract labor, the labor movement, has been dominated by men. Um, the image of the typical <coughs> laborer no, is a male image. No, and that has kind of set the tone and set the, the tonality of resist, anti-capitalist resistance based on abstract labor. Okay. The, the whole argument about the cracks is that really there is a breakdown in that whole grammar of resistance. Okay. That what we see emerging in the cracks, what we see emerging in spaces like this, is uh, and that are really attacks on abstract labor, attacks on that sort of concept of activity. Okay. What's emerging in the cracks is the understanding that anti-capitalism to be against capital means to be against labor. Okay. In other words, that we can no longer think of the antagonism as an antagonism between capital and labor. It is rather anti-capitalism means the rejection not only of capital, but the rejection of the type of activity that produces capital, in other words, the rejection of abstract labor. And part of that attack on labor is, of course, an attack on the whole culture of labor, and therefore a, 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 a whole, the whole male-dominated culture, male-dominated and bisexual culture of labor. And the, the subject, if we see the kind of revolution, if we, yeah, if we want to talk about a revolutionary subject, okay, then we cannot think of the revolutionary subject as labor, but as this concrete doer um, which is fighting the, that is emerging in the cracks and fighting against the la against labor and that if we want to attach a gender 
to that subject, then we have to see that gender as being predominantly female, that that is actually what is happening um, at the moment. I mean, that in partly in just in the term, in terms of the, the composition of, of the movements that are emerging, um, but um, also in the implications of the movements as being attacks on the sort of sexuality associated with, with abstract labour. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, there's a uh, kind of an easy way in, in 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 one of the things I argue is that it, 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 the tradition is to talk about the working class in the third person as a they. Okay. What I think is that what we're seeing now is actually the emergence of people are talking more and more in terms of, of, of we. Now, in Spanish, you don't have a gender neutral we. It's either nosotros or, nosotra or nosotras. What I'm arguing is that if we have to attach a gender, we really have to think of nosotras, no? of a feminine we. people looking perplexed. I can come back to that. <laughs> um, the question of publishing. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't have any um, I don't have any easy answer to that, I think. Um, I don't know whether you want to f formulate it more pres um why do I get Plut? I mean, oh <laughs> obviously, I think alternative. Oh. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you want to form formulate it more precisely or. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I wasn't really. I suppose I was just kind of. kind of get your thoughts on your own relationship with, because I, I don't know how, um, yeah, I don't know, I just wanted to put it out there, just like the links between your work and kind of the necessary assume compromises that come with getting it out there and how that kind of, how you work that back into what you do and who you are and all that kind of thing. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't think there aren't, I suppose I feel there aren't necessary compromises. Um, I think that that, that um, mm, that you say what you want to say, and and you try and get it published. I think I don't know whether you're thinking. I mean, one thing that strikes me very much, especially here now in in in, in the universities in England and, and in Scotland, is the pressure to push publish in the right journals and the pressure to formulate your arguments in a particular way that kind of slot in with the, 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 the reigning, the, the, the dominant academic language. And I, it seems to me that, that those pressures can be resisted, in fact. Um, I'm inclined to say, look, we have to, we have to have the confidence, I suppose, the <coughs> self-confidence to say, no, this is our language. This is, you know, we have to create our own language. And, yeah. Take three more. Cathy, then Bridget. Mm -hmm. okay. I just wondered, um, well, about 30 years ago, what I understood what was really going on in your country in particular um, was a war without bullets. Sorry? A war without bullets. War without bullets. Uh -huh. ah, which yes. sorry, which is sure. um, social, economic, and psychological sort of a war, in particular um, against the poor. Um, and how how that 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 war has been um, intensified under yeah. what's happened. Yeah. But and just briefly. Um, Personally, I just feel that that we are facing global genocide um, because 
because consumerism has become such an addiction. And I don't think people, I think people are sort of awakening up um, to what's really going on, but I don't think we'll wake up in time. Mm. I just wondered what I'm thinking. Okay. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about what you think of the changing structures within the neoliberal university. Um, I've just read a very alarming book um, called Academic Capitalism and the New Economy. Um, and this was a, a study of American universities. Uh, and it was alarming because it pointed to certain things as occurring within those universities which uh, we can only see the beginnings of here, but which are very developed there. I'm talking about <coughs> things like um, the commodification of research in the form of patented knowledge, which has enormously increased. I'm talking about things like uh, the commodification of teaching, not just in the form of, you know, as we're experiencing now, expecting students to pay £9,000 for our teaching, but in the form of selling off things like lecture packs for large amounts of money. I'm talking about the <coughs> it, great increase in the number of part-time staff what is called the contingent labour force, as though they weren't necessary. Uh, <laughs> and the decline of the full-time staff. I'm talking about the huge amounts of money for vice-chancellors and principals in some of these universities, which is quite unprecedented. Um, Corporatisation, as um, Pazaliki says and um, also of some research stars who are professors. Um, but then uh, we're also noticing that this is accompanied by a lack of interest in having previously disadvantaged groups into universities, mm -hmm. like mature students who come in the access route, maybe like this person who was speaking from Clive Bank originally. Um, and uh, all the trends are that people of colour in American universities are going down as a proportion, for example. And the, these, and the last thing which I'll mention, which I think is absolutely horrific to imagine, but is apparently happening, which is that business corporations are actually doing peer reviews of uh, research agendas and of research articles so that the corporation comes right into that process of intellectual activity. Um, and I wonder what your thoughts are about this, because it seems to me that we've perhaps lived in a situation under social democracy where the universities, so to speak, are being mediated. It's a space where uh, there's, there's been mediated by um, various professional rules, and that these forms of mediation um, are now being swept away, and capitalism is quite nakedly dominating the pursuit of profit through universities. Mm. Mm. Uh, just in relation to, uh, I suppose, the kind of metaphor of tracks in relation to capital, uh, I think there might be a slight problem in that uh, capital isn't one kind of uh, smooth surface, it's a kind of homogenous, expanding beast. And I think when people maybe think that it will reach an ecological limit, it may do in certain areas, but to me, I could see that as a possible uh, growth point for capital. I mean, there's been a lot of talk like, you know, I know we claim people about disaster capitalism, but capitalism, because it needs room to expand into, uh, war and disaster are two kind of areas that can increase productivity. I mean, get the massive productivist boom uh, after the Second World War because so much stuff had been destroyed. So that gave capitalism, whether it was uh, you know, Marshall Pl and, and that to an extent, you know, uh, was capitalism also changed to become 
more sort of Keynesian social democratic uh, kind of Marshall Plan, and uh, we also had that kind of same productivity maybe to a larger scale in Russia, which a lot of people see as, as a capitalist uh, a state. Uh, run capitalist uh, economy, and you know, are we actually going to reach like a kind of, you know, is it a point like a like a line that we reach, or is the problem not that in some ways responses will be cracked as well in relation, if you see what I mean, in relation to the fact that uh, capitalism can exist for a long time, almost you know, can be like uh, capitalism is obsessed with ecology and think or already or. or Pretending to be obsessed with ecology and human rights can expand on for a long time in new spaces. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the um, first first question about the war without bullets, I agree completely. I mean, the the Zapatistas talk a lot about the f this, <coughs> this situation as being the fourth world war, um, about about neoliberalism being the fourth world war, and probably. The number of people killed by <coughs> neoliberalism over the last um, what, 20, 25 years is far greater than the number of than the hundred million or so killed in the Second World War. No, I mean, it's what it's. I don't know what the figure is, but certainly the the, the figure of fifty thousand people per day who die simply because they cannot pay for medicine um, is. Or I'm sure it's much. Anyway, it's an enormous figure. I don't, you know. So I think that's right, um, that we can think of it as being a war without bullets. It's an extremely violent um, war. Um, and that really makes, yeah, makes, makes it much more urgent, if you like, to think of revolution not in 50 years' time, but revolution here and now. How do we break that dynamic he here and now? Um, on what what you were saying, Bridget, I yes, I agree completely. I mean, I think um, you described very well what's happening in the universities. I mean, it, I suppose it's happening in a slightly different form and in different countries. I mean, it's happening as well in in in, in obviously in Mexico. Um, but well, when I, I don't know about Mexico. well, it is. Let me assure you, yeah. it, it, is, it is happening there as well. But certainly, when I come here and see the forms that it's taking here, and people talking about economic impact and how um, yeah. impact counts as twenty for twenty five percent or something of the 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 assess research assessment exercise, and how different journals have their um, numeration in terms of economic impact I and mean, it just seems to me that that is that the insanity of it all and the extent to which it has developed over the last what 10 years I don't know or 10 15 years is absolutely extraordinary mm -hmm. and extraordinarily depressing um, and that that's in a way what we're talking about as well I mean how do you break that you know, and I think there are some things that we can break more easily than others. We can, you know, we can. That seems to me what what free Hetherington is about. There is a sense I always feel that there's a sense in which, as teachers or as students, we always have the power to go in the opposite direction. We always have the power to say, no, we won't fit in. We will actually fill our teaching or studying activity in a different way. You know, no matter what we're teaching or where, what, you know, which department we're in or whatever, you know, we, I suppose the classroom, if you like, is the, our space of power where we can actually do things create power, go in a different direction, or not just in the classroom, obviously, in every, everything we do. And I think rather than thinking, I mean, certainly we have to bemoan what happens, but we have to go beyond bemoaning, and we have to do everything that we can to go in the opposite direction and say, no, look, in this situation, we actually have to talk about different things that don't fit in very easily, but th with the directions that we're being pushed in. 
Other things obviously um, require much more collective organization um, in terms of what you're doing. But you know, but but sometimes we just have to be resolute and collective and say, look, collectively we can say all this gradation and of journals in terms of impact is absolutely insane. It doesn't make any sense. No, and we we I don't know. Yeah, I mean that's that you know, because it's really a horrifying situation. Yeah. The last thing I heard, is, you probably correct me if I'm wrong, but that 75% of the money for the Arts and Humanities Research Board for research they are proposing should be on Cameron's idea of the big society. Can you imagine that? Um, that is really terrifying. I'm convinced there will be an uprising of that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, but you, we, I think we also think, well, how do we turn it around? Let's, you know, how do we say, okay, let's take the big society, and let's call their bluff. Let's really talk about how we can control society. You know, let's do it. Let's go to the theorists who've talked about that. Let's go to Marx. Let's go to, I don't know, all the anarchist theorists, whatever. Let's take that seriously. You know, I think part of the struggle has to be a kind of bluff calling, no? mm. isn't it? Just to say, yeah, I mean, rather than just saying, well, they don't really mean it. Of course, they don't really mean it, but let's call their bluff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and um, yes, no, I mean it's just horrifying. I have a friend who's a, a professor of. Of, of politics um, in one of the English universities and is obviously quite quite radical um, and he's recently had a, an advisor attached to him by the head of department an advisor who can advise him how to publish in the right journals and not just in and, oh my god how sick you know how sick the whole system is becoming um, the, the, the question about capitalism expanding, yeah, there's a problem. I mean, the, the metaphor of the crack. Um, I think the crack, the cr crack appeals to me because I think actually that's where we start. We actually want to go. <laughs> no, we want to break. We see what's happening. You think, my God, how can we break that? How can we break the dynamic? No. And, and the danger, of course, is that you know, we're trying to crack something that's all gooey and splodgy, and when we crack, it kind of oozes around our hands all over again. Um, you know, which, in a way, is what capital does, of course, because capital responds all the time by, by trying to suck us back into its, its mud. You know? and, and, um, but I do think that what we what what happens and what movements have been learning in a way is a lot. I mean, all the time, I suppose, what the anti-capitalist movement learns is how you avoid that process. Okay, I mean, you can say, well, I mean, here in Free Hetherington, you know, I mean, I don't know whether there was any attempt at any stage to kind of negotiate and draw you back into the structures of the university, but presumably, if there were. You know, you, you you develop, you develop ways of dealing with that. So I don't think, I th think it's completely wrong to start off thinking, well, whatever attempt we make to break the system will inevitably be sucked back in. Okay, let them try and suck us in, but let us not do their job for them by assuming that that's going to happen. No, um, but I. I mean, I agree it's a real issue, and of course capital is a movement of, of, of reintegrating resistances, of learning through resistances, of learning through people doing other things, no? And we just have to fight against that all the time. Just to be saying, just I think though sometimes the problem is nowadays with the kind of focusing on ecological disaster. Uh, I think there's something quite slightly dangerous about that. It's almost like, uh, I mean, someone said, you know, you can imagine the end of the world easier than the end of capitalism. Yeah. And uh, I think, you know, 
uh, as well, it almost seems to be like really sort of like a kind of teleological kind of mountain. People kind of imagine it'll just all end one day. Whereas I can, I think there's a lot of evidence to sort of suggest that as disasters happen, capitalism might move in as a kind of micromanagement in how to deal with these disasters mm. kind of thing. And it's a kind of dangerous thing for, I think, particularly the green, a lot of the green movement, I think, has already been quite co-opted by capitalism to a certain extent. Uh, so, for example, you know, you see a lot of adverts. Well, virtually all the adverts now have some kind of green basis to them. Whereas you don't really get adverts about class contradiction, or you don't get, you know what I mean? So, I think, you know, we've got to watch as well that we're not being led by an agenda that's kind of suitable for capitalism. I think there are cracks, but they're almost the things that you almost couldn't get adverts for. And I think things like class contradictions and, like, labour, things to do that are kind of, um, you know, possibly have more potential as a crack than necessarily an idea of some kind of apocalypse. Yeah, I think... I mean, I agree, I think, with, with most of what you say, anyway. I, mean, I think that the whole question of um, ecological destruction, I mean, that, that is something, obviously, that we have to take very seriously. But the, the obvious response is, OK, I mean, there is this real um, rush towards human self-destruction. But the key to us, and this is obvious, no? the key to us is actually the way in which human activity is organized. And it seems to me very unlikely that you can stop it as long as the main force of social determination is profit. No? And the main controlling force is, is money. No? And when all these institutions go on about it, I mean, when the university says, oh, you know, this is really an important topic, we should say, well, right, it's an important topic. And that means that we have to get rid of capitalism. And in a way, that comes back to the question of negativity that Gordon introduced at the beginning. It does <coughs> seem to me we have to understand our own thinking as being grounded in negativity, partly, partly as a kind of a flag I mean, I think we sometimes feel we should go around holding flags that say, no, capitalism stinks. Capitalism is a catastrophe for humanity. You know, place that on the table in every meeting, in every seminar, in every <laughs> lecture, and then start from there. You know. That's Maybe we take two more last contributions, take away from folk that haven't already. <coughs> yeah, um, I read your book Negativity and Revolution, um, in which you, it's the theoretical, but you celebrate the negative dialectic. Now, of course, there's conflict amongst people about what they believe in, what method to use, and I suppose you're all between, you know, maybe anarchists, socialists, economists. So, um, could you add or address the conflict theoretically and practically? So, for instance, create social spaces of I don't know, solidarity across um, different belief systems, and also to I don't know, expand on your concept of negative dialectics. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, just to keep it quite short, but when I, I hadn't read Crack Capitalism, but when I first read the title, I completely uh, perceived it in a way, I thought you were talking, my metaphor was entirely different, a notion of crack capitalism as a, uh, an extreme form of, uh, of capitalism uh, in relation to the drug. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just wondered what your thoughts on that idea are, given that so much of certainly Western forms of capitalism are predicated on um, desire and uh, people's individual desires in particular. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Um, it seems to me that um, the, this idea of um, just completely um, withdraw, uh, I suppose it relates to the question of labour and the role of labour in terms of um, overcoming capitalism. And it seems to me that this idea of just withdrawing from the workforce um, actually leaves um, a very 
it's a potentially very important area of struggle kind of neglected because I mean I, I, I fully approve of the idea of creating uh, environments and spaces which anticipate a sort of post-capitalist society and I think that's very important and it's something which I think the you know the, the radical movement in the past um, has neglected in the sense of the importance of demonstrating to people like ways in which it's practical to make a, you know a new society that doesn't function on capitalist logic and I totally agree with that but you know at the same time that there is the fact you know being part of the workforce and actually being um, part of that process of, of yes you're part of the process of making labor and making capitalism but you're also in a position to organize collectively to withdraw labor um, which um, you know you can do via strikes and so on which is a very historically has been a, a very effective way of getting uh, you know achievements in, in terms of fighting against capitalism and um, you know, um, and, and that's useful if only for the process of coordination. You know, so you know, if you had a, a Europe-wide um, uh, movement based on the working class, you could coordinate that process of um, uh, of, of rejecting capitalism, um, which would be far more effective, I think, than just doing it on a sort of localized piecemeal basis. So, if only for practical reasons, I think actually that's very important. And it seems to me that sometimes in in your uh, in your ideas, there's this um, uh, there's a sort of rejection of the uh, I the idea of actually uh, organising collectively within the, the the capitalist workforce, and um, yeah, and, and a certain a re certain rejection of of the the political side of doing that as well. And it just seems to me that 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 um, is kind of missing out on something that could be very useful for us. Yeah, no, I, just, I think I agree with you. I mean, I, I, if you think of practically all the examples this evening that have come up, not all, but an awful lot, we haven't actually been talking about withdrawing from the workforce. On the contrary, who is against labour? Obviously, the people who suffer it from nine to five every day. They are the ones who are most intensely anti labor. You know, if we think of ourselves as being the workforce, what we've been talking about is okay, here we are. I'm not saying I'm going to give up my job after this meeting. I'm just, no, I'm just, you know. No, I was going to. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying no. Where we are, we have to find a way of turning it against labour, of turning it into an activity that makes sense, that pushes against the, 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 the tide, that pushes against the meaningless of capitalism. And that is actually what... It, so it's not, a theory, it's not at all a theory of exodus. Okay. I don't think of the... I think of the cracks, if you like, as being partly, to some extent, yes. I mean, it's people who drop out and they say no we're not going to sell our labor power we're going to find some other way of, of living we're going to go off and set up an, an organic farm or whatever collect collective farm great you know but it's not only that it's also any form of revolt that kind of goes against that ref is based on a kind of refusal and says you know even in this situation where we seem to be completely dominated, we actually have the power to go, to do something else. You know? Even if you think of the of the of, of the soldier in the firing squad, there is always the power of refusal. You know, there is always the power of doing something else. So it's not at all saying the struggle should be outside the work, the, 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 the place of, of, of work. It's saying no. On the contrary, we have to understand the unity of struggles in the workplace and outside the workplace as being a unity of struggles, not just against capital, but against labour. No? And if you think of strikes, for example, I mean, strikes are a very important part of struggle, but instead of just seeing them as being strikes um, by labour against capital, say, for higher wages or better conditions for labour. In fact, what happens in strikes to, to, as well, or to, is that people are saying, 
great, you know, now this breaks the labor, it breaks the drudgery, it breaks the mind-deadening nine-to-five routine. <coughs> you know? This, you know, and we don't say that openly. We say, oh, we're, we want higher wages or whatever. You know, instead of saying openly, well, actually what we hate is, is the kind of labor we're involved in. You know? And I think not just in factories, that is increasingly the case as well in the universities or with teachers or whatever. You know? um, so I'm very glad you brought that up <coughs> because I really feel it, it's very important. It's not a theory of saying... Um, no. And also we have to, even if you think of, 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 of social centres, even if you think of the, the, or these very alternative activities, people have to survive. You know, people have to survive and they do it not only I mean they may be able to generate their own food by cultivating it or whatever but they also work or very often work part time or they work part of the year or they whatever I mean, we, you know we're all in contradictory situations <coughs> the question is how do you struggle from that contradictory situation but struggle struggle in relation to the context of the tent of our activity. You know? And that's what gets hidden, I suppose, by the traditional um, structure of trade unionism. You know? the, the, um, the, the question of negative, negative dialectics, yeah, I mean, that really relates as well to the, to the previous point I was making about the importance of negativity. I mean, I think partly just practically, you know, um, in, it seems to me that in, in, a, in, a, in a place like this, in, in free Heather, Hetherington or whatever, any kind of crack, there's the constant for, force kind of drawing us back into, into conformity, drawing us back into the system. And if we say and say explicitly, well, yes, here we are trying to create something wonderful. No? Here we are trying to create a lovely environment that other ways of thinking and relating or whatever but we are doing it against we are doing it we are doing that be, by saying no to the prevailing form you know then that simply strengthens our struggle in other words we we strengthening we strengthen our our resistance our revolt by grounding it firmly in negativity um, so the importance of the negative dialectic, I would say, the importance of the negative because we actually start from a no to, to kind of be left-wing or rebellious or revolutionary in any sense. <coughs> you start by saying no to the world that we experience and that we see around us. Okay? So let's recognize that, that that actually gives us a way of, the, of, of grounding <coughs> our own theorizing in, in negativity. Right. If we don't recognize it, then we're kind of glossing over that initial, initial point of departure. And the other problem is that if we gloss over that initial point of departure, we are creating bridges, I think, to the theory, theories that say yes and kind of simply assume that, um, that, 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 that capitalism is eternal, for example. In other words, starting with a no is a way of saying, look, there is a radical rupture between bourgeois theory and the sense of theory that, that assumes the eternal character of, of, of capitalist social relations and anti-capitalist theory that says, no, they're not eternal. Okay, there's a radical theoretical rupture there. We're not talking, asking the same questions. <coughs> We don't want to bridge. We have to actually separate. And why, dial why negative dialectics as opposed to just dialectics? Because, of course, the argument, and the argument articulated most clearly by Adorno, is that the dialectics in, in the previous <coughs> previously dominant conception of dialectics, dialectics focused, as, focused on the synthesis, on the kind of happy ending. And what negative dialectics does is to say, no, we're not talking of synthesis, we're talking of, 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 of negativity. No, that's, okay. But whereas the kind of French and Italian tradition kind of throws out the whole dialectic 
um, tradition, I suppose, simply because of that synthetic, uh, synthetic emphasis. You know, what, what Adorno or the tradition of uh, negative dialectics approach does is to say, no, that's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We actually have to think from negativity. Um, the, the, the question of, of crack capitalism and desire and ah, crack and yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Um, that was one of the objections. Um, yeah, I mean, this comes back to the question of the publishers. You know. <laughs> um, the, when, when I proposed the title for Change the World Without Taking Power, the previous book, you know, they said, no, that hopeless, won't do as a title at all. Why not call it grassroots democracy? <coughs> and we had a whole battle over it, and I said, no. And I think I was right. <laughs> <laughs> the question of crack capitalism, they said, well, isn't there a problem here that people will understand this is relating it to the drug? And I said, well, yes, there is a problem. But on the other hand, I suppose what we have to do is just make the idea of crack capitalism into such an important idea and such an important concept that people recognize it immediately and go out and <laughs> smash capitalism. Um, and desire and yes, um, that gets too complicated for me. And um, yeah, desire, I, I suppose I would think of it in terms of negativity, in terms of negative dialectics, etc., rather than in terms of the, the anti-dialectic um, currents that, that the concept of desire is of, of often related to. But, but I don't really want to go any further into that. So that's, that's it. Um, but yes, to crack capitalism, that's what we should do. <laughs> and that's what you are doing and that is what we are doing that's great and thank you very very much indeed.